This is a presentation of the article Partisanship and Unreformed Bureaucracy, the Drivers of Election Fraud in Sweden, 1719-1908, written by Professor Jan Theoriel. These days, we consider Sweden to be a mature democracy, with established civil liberties and voting rights, free and fair democratic elections, and functioning democratic institutions. This was, of course, far from always the case, and the successful democratization of Sweden and other countries interests historians and political scientists. When did it happen? How did it happen? Why did it happen? Some well-researched democratization aspects include the evolution and institutionalization of civil liberties, such as freedom of expression and organization, the extension of the suffrage itself, and how executive power was gradually becoming accountable to Parliament. Sweden was largely liberalized politically through the introduction of a bicameral Parliament in 1866. The process of making the cabinet responsible to the Parliament rather than the King is usually considered to have been completed around 1917. Universal male suffrage was established in 1911, female suffrage in 1921, but when and how did Sweden develop the capacity to organize free and fair elections? Free and fair elections are among the first things that come to mind when you talk about democracy, and increasing capacity to organize such free and fair elections should be a key democratization element. But for some reason, it has not attracted a lot of scholarly attention among established Western democracies such as Sweden. There are good reasons why it should. This is Jan Teuel, professor of political science at Lund University. When we study democratization today in the modern world, in developing countries, suffrage is rarely the problem. Suffra the suffrage has usually been extended to the general population already. Um, the executive is all, either directly or indirectly elected. Um, so that's not really the problem for democratization today. What most countries struggle with is getting their elections free and fair. And this makes Sweden an interesting case, because in our case, that had already happened. Uh, we already had free and fair, relatively free and fair elections when we introduced the suffrage and, and made the, the executive responsible to parliament. Sweden is also a good case to study because we have very good archival resources that do, uh, made me uh, able to track these things way back in time. Teorel decided to analyze changes of electoral fraud filed with the authorities by disgruntled people. The frequency and nature of the complaints would provide some indication of how elections and election cleanness changed over time. The study took him back to 1719, when the first Diet of Estates convened during the so-called Age of Liberty, when electoral practices in Sweden first became firmly established. The Age of Liberty really is the birth of Swedish electoral practices. The Diet of Estates comprised four different estates. The House of Nobility, the House of Clerics, the House of Burghers, and the House of Peasants. With the exception of the House of Nobility and parts of the House of Clerics, representatives were elected, although in different ways. Naturally, the suffrage was very limited, even within the peasantry, only those who owned their land or had a leasehold from the state were enfranchised. Still, the actual election process could be more or less corrupt or clean, which is what any filed complaints should show. The Diet, or Riksdag of Estates, was replaced by a bicameral parliament in 1866. But Teorel's study proceeds until just before the next big electoral system modernization in 1911, when proportional representation was introduced. In the covered 189 years, 54 parliamentary elections took place, and in each case, petitions were filed by unhappy voters. We can subdivide this long era into four distinct periods that correspond to big structural changes of government in Swedish political history. In the first period, the Age of Liberty, kings were relatively weak and there was a lot of competition for political power between two main political parties the hats, and the caps. In the second period, the Gustavian age, the parties were banned and the power of the estates were very limited. Only five parliamentary sessions were convened in almost 40 years. 
In the third period, royal power is reined in by a new constitution that also demands that parliaments be summoned at least every five years. The fourth and final period is characterized by reforms that lead up to a modern-looking electoral system. Terrell plotted the frequency of petitions along the timeline. What were the results? During the Age of Liberty, the share of complaints increases gradually and almost explodes as it draws to a close. This massive increase corresponds to a lot of unrest in the years before the military-backed coup of King Gustavus III in 1772. As might perhaps be expected, the diminishing importance of parliament that ensues leads to fewer election petitions in the Gustavian age. This gradually changes in the third period. Elections become more important again, and we see a great spike in 1866, which is the first election to the new bicameral parliament. The fourth period, the age of reforms, displays short-term fluctuations, but is generally trending downwards. So much for the overall frequency, but the actual content of the complaints and the council law court's hearing and verdicts are obviously crucial. How serious were the charges? Did they indicate intentional corruption or simply mistakes? Were concerns validated? To get to the bottom of this, Terrell coded election petitions containing the most serious charges between 1721 and 1865, after which the Diet of Estates was abolished. First, he made a distinction between what appeared to be irregularities and actual fraud, where someone was, at least allegedly, actively trying to influence the election result. In 1771, the city mayor Kjörning in the city of Hernesand was accused of having registered people not eligible to vote, and of counting votes for people not present at the polls in order to improve his own chances. In 1859, a losing candidate in the city of Lund complained about several shortcomings in the burghers' election, mostly pertaining to alleged faults in the electoral register, but he did not claim that anyone had intentionally fabricated the results. The first case would be registered as fraud, while the second would be regarded as an irregularity. Many accusations are concerned with unclear rules and regulations, and not with a voting procedure as such. It might have been unclear who was eligible to stand for office, or had the right to vote, or how to technically handle things like counting votes. Fraud, as I coded it, is almost exclusively concentrated to the 1771 election. Allegations are in most cases severe. City magistrates and district judges are accused of defying the actual voting polls and certifying someone other than the nominal winner. In almost all these cases, the council and courts pleaded guilty to the charges, so it cannot be doubted that the elections of 1771 were marred by fraud. By the final elections to the Diet of Estates, however, in the mid-19th century, petitions had become very different. For the most part, they tended to focus on technical ambiguities rather than on highlighting potential fraud. Were noblemen eligible to stand for office in the House of Burghers? Were persons running a private business or working for the Crown eligible to stand for office in the House of Peasants? Was it possible to reject becoming a Diet representative if you had in fact been elected? All these kinds of questions and more were of course important, but petitioners were mainly looking for technical guidance, not hinting at corrupted practices. A look at secondary sources homing in on the first decades of the bicameral era makes it clear that the trend holds. Petitions continue to focus on negligence, ignorance, and indifference, and not on malicious intent to influence election results. Election fraud is simply no longer a major concern. Terrell's study of petitions shows that the fraudulent practices of the Age of Liberty appear to have been more or less eradicated by the mid-19th century. But why? What explains the rise and sudden disappearance of election fraud in Sweden? Previous research offers some testable ideas. One theory is that the establishment of the secret ballot might curb fraud as it is harder to bully or buy voters when their actual voting behavior can't be observed. Another is that the electoral system itself has something to do with it. In systems where you vote for a single district representative, like in the current British system, who just needs to get more votes than anyone else to win, you need to influence only a modest number of votes to affect the results 
which would make fraud more tempting. Changing the electoral system to something like proportional representation would lessen that sort of temptation. A third idea is that socioeconomic modernization can help. Put simply, it is easier to bribe poor people than richer ones, so economic development should help suppress fraud. A fourth factor might be landholding inequality. Perhaps powerful rural landowners were able to control election officials to attain desirable political results. If so, equalization of land ownership should lead to fewer cases of election fraud. So, which of these factors explain the reduction of electoral fraud in Sweden in the studied period? Actually, none of them. The secret ballot was introduced only in 1866, and not even then securely for all kinds of elections. So we have to go to 1911 or even later in the 20th century to find uh, this, the, the, ballot, the, the ballot secrecy uh, uh, well established in Sweden. When it comes to proportional representation, that was introduced in Sweden in the election of 1911, so more than a century after our elections became relatively free and fair. So that obviously also cannot explain it. And when it comes to socioeconomic uh, development, that also takes off relatively late in Swedish political history, towards the late 19th century. And Sweden never really had that kind of uh, socioeconomic inequality based on land uh, as in Germany, for example. So that also uh, cannot really explain why in the elections in the late 18th century already turned relatively free and fair. These four candidates, the secret ballot, the electoral system, socioeconomic modernization and landholding inequality, all focus on possible incentives to commit fraud. But maybe we should instead look at how different administrative solutions can present or prevent opportunities for fraud to occur. To establish effective oversight by some entity who is not involved in the election itself, such as courts or an independent commission, would likely combat and reduce fraud. More generally, so should a professionalized bureaucracy. This can mean many different things, but a key element is that recruitment and promotion of administrators are not political decisions, and that these decisions are made based on merit. It is expensive to fund electoral fraud, and one way of financing this expense might be to sell access to cozy and maybe lucrative jobs in the administration. This option is removed when the bureaucracy is professionalized. And if elections are to be tampered with, then someone in the bureaucracy will likely have to do the actual tampering. But if bureaucrats are regular employees who are appointed and promoted based on merit, why would they want to? There is a lot of evidence that the Swedish bureaucracy was far from professionalized during the Age of Liberty, and oversight of elections was no exception. County governors, who heard first instance complaints, were appointed by the Council of the Realm, that is, by the executive. And the same council was also the highest court of appeals for these petitions. The same was true for election administrators, the magistrates in the cities and the district judges in the country. This means that there was little or no professional distance between elites who might want to influence an election and the people who are supposed to manage elections or keep them clean. Many such bureaucrats or judges were hardly honest, upstanding people either. Both mayors and district judges figured prominently among cases of official misconduct, and they were charged with anything from misdemeanors to more serious crimes, including bribery and embezzlement. This all changed during the first half of the 19th century when the whole Swedish state became more professionalized. Election officials were recruited based on merit rather than patronage or political connections. They also became, by and large, salaried employees. This meant that if you wanted fabricated election results, there was no longer a cadre of politicized and unprofessional officials who could execute this plan for you. Bureaucrats who were able and willing to influence elections in one way or another could be considered a supply-side factor, and Terrell's research shows how this supply is reduced in the late 18th century. But what about the demand side? Demand for committing fraud is related to how meaningful it would be. If even successful fraud would not really bring any political benefits or power, why take the risk? 
After all, you might get caught. Terrell argues that a neglected driver of electoral fraud is the existence of multiple political parties as main contenders. He believes that political parties raise the stakes involved in an election. It simply becomes more important to win an election when many parties appear at the polls. But why? One reason is that there is simply more power to play for, as multi-party competition seems to strengthen the influence of elected officials over the executive branch. Party-based elections also tend to mean the nationalization of election campaigns, which will provide more recognition and perks for candidates. But more important is that parties are better at gathering around and pursuing policy initiatives. It is simply more likely that political ideas will at some point be turned into reality. When we look at the final years of the Age of Liberty, the hats and caps parties fought ferociously along parties and lines over the control of the Diet and the Council, and the 1771 contest more so than most. Huge sums of money were lavished on candidates, mainly from foreign powers. Crucially, the money was channeled through the two parties. To get a share, a candidate would have to be on a party ticket. These parties were, of course, in a way cliques held together by personal ties, but they did compete over policy as well. Foreign funds and deepening policy divide created obvious incentives to win elections, to the point where fraud was on the cards. This situation was radically changed after the 1772 coup by Gustavus III. The very use of the established party names, hats and caps, was banned. And throughout this reign, Gustavus made organized election activities difficult. Even after his death, development of political parties was stifled. Indeed, partisan struggle did not really re-enter Swedish political life until the end of the 19th century. After that point, parties again emerged as the main political channels to power. But with demand picking up, shouldn't that also lead to a resurgence of fraud? Well, I argue that election fraud should be more prevalent when both the supply side, when the bureaucracy is less professionalized, and the demand side, political parties compete at the polls, are in play. After the so-called tariff elections of 1887, Demand increased, but there was no longer any real supply, as the bureaucracy, including election administrators, was becoming much more professional. In fact, by the 1870s at the latest, the Swedish state appears to have been fully bureaucratized. Noble privileges had disappeared, a uniform salary system had been introduced, and the government agencies had been reorganizing with efficiency and meritocracy as major drivers. To test these claims further, Terrell examined some 43 House of Burger elections that took place in the early spring of 1771. It turned out that elections were indeed more fraudulent where the election administration was less autonomous and where elections were more partisan. So, a professionalized bureaucracy combined with a strong element of partisanship appears to explain a great deal of the election fraud that has taken place in Sweden. The remaining questions are, is this unique to Sweden? And where do we go, research-wise, from here? I mean, one question that could be raised, of course, is, is this an explanation that is unique to Sweden, or does it travel elsewhere? Uh, and I think it does. Uh, Victorian Britain, for example, had uh, high levels of electoral bribery uh, that also rose uh, during the 19th century as the elections became more partisan, the partisan struggle increased, and then decreased after they introduced civil service reforms and other reforms to the process uh, through which they adjudicated their elections. In the United States, a case where we do not have a professionalized bureaucracy, increasing levels in partisanship, uh, partisan elections also meant increasing levels of electoral fraud, even electoral violence in the 19th century. And I also think that we can make the case that this travels to other parts of the world today. Of course, I mean, this doesn't mean that I'm against partisan elections. I think uh, partisanship uh, is one of the things that democracy couldn't survive without. But it does mean that it's uh, really important from this perspective, too, to think about bureaucratic reforms. Uh, 
in order to combat electoral fraud in uh, developing countries today.